When art and engineering combine, spectacular things can happen. And that is exactly the case with this next tiny house, which is absolutely jam-packed with clever and beautiful features. Hey, Gori Ma, how oh, are you? Hello, Bryce. Hi. <laughs> Lovely nice to meet you. Hello, Bryce. G'day, Nirvana. How's it going? <laughs> Good. What an absolutely magical spot you have here. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We're very blessed to be in such a beautiful place. Mm. And your home is just beautiful. What a work of art. <laughs> Oh, thank you. A labour of love, I think, is yeah. a good way of describing it, yeah. First of all, can you tell me about why you decided to build a tiny house on wheels? Our main reason was that we wanted our own home. Because we're both in our separate lives and having raised many kids, we've spent years in rented accommodation. I think um, Gori's moved house, I think, 40, 45 times in her life. <laughs> wow. And I've probably owned two houses in my time and built about four and in helping to build a tiny house within a carpentry practice i had in victoria it became obvious we can afford this we could design it and we could make most of it ourselves and can you tell me about the land that you're on right now where we are right now belongs to a friend of mine. We're on uh, the far south coast of New South Wales, a very pristine and beautiful part of the world. And so it was just an opportunity for us. Once we'd done a lot of the building in a workshop, we needed to get out and onto land to sort of get on with the next phase. And we just got given the opportunity to come up here. So we brought the house up here about a year ago to sort of get on with the bigger part of the build, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have the most spectacular gardens. Talk to me about this. <laughs> well, this was an old stockyard. So it's been an absolute godsend. We do have a big mob of kangaroos live all over this land here. And you'll see them if you're here in the evening. So going inside the stockyard was fantastic. It meant everything wouldn't get eaten. And uh, the soil was spectacular. I mean, I think this property is at least a hundred years old so it's a hundred years of cow poo and horse poo so we just dug it up and planted and it's been amazing the whole summer we've been eating out of it and yeah really that was a big intent for us that we had to start gardening you know I think somebody said one day oh but you're living in a tiny house why are you gardening and I said but it's all about the garden for us you know the house is just small and manageable and now we can get out onto the land and plant and grounded. Tiny house but massive garden. I can yeah. completely get on board with that. Yeah. Now just by looking at the house I can tell that you both have a tremendous artistic flair. <laughs> can you talk to me about this wonderful thing that you've created for the entranceway? I envisage that a house or a home is the garden around it where you meet and you eat and you be with people and the birds and, and the animals come and that a entrance is needed so this was something i made for our wedding for people to come through and it has been a very old tradition particularly in japan and many western european nations too to have an entrance yeah well i think it's a lovely idea it's obviously a wonderful artistic piece for the house and i do feel that in a way it extends the home into the garden and it connects the mm. house to the outside so mm. i think that's a lovely feature yeah and now let's talk about the house. I love what you have done with these pop-outs. That must have just created so much additional space in the home. Yeah, well I have to say when we were first looking and thinking about building a tiny house, one of our very first inspirations was the tiny house castle. And um, Nirvana particularly, who also has an engineering background, was like, wow, I like what this guy's doing. We can really think about this. And we'd seen a lot of tiny houses with a big entrance and a bit of a deck and then somewhere in our brains we worked out that you know we could have a fold down floor and a lift up roof and then all these panels at the front are literally just sliding panels and all just held in there by screws and the design of the home is simply remarkable i love the way that you've got the extended features but also these wonderful curved aspects on the end of the home as well as this remarkable <laughs> roof line how on earth did you do that 
Well, I saw that all the tiny houses, they look like a matchbox sitting on its side. They're far too top heavy. My design work has always been with sacred geometry. So the re it's a relationship with the length of the trailer and the curve. And my hunch was that by having this double curve, it would ground the house and wouldn't allow this top heavy phenomena. And I think it has worked. The front curve came spontaneously when I was working with the trailer builders who made a steel superstructure for me to build around because they had these curve members in their workshop. And I said, can you just put that in the front and I'll work around that, you know? So that's how that happened. One of the other things that I really like about it is the use of the round windows. It just adds a little bit more flair to the home, doesn't it? Yeah, they're, they're beautiful and they really make the space, you know, and the windows being able to swivel and it's really cute and unusual. Mm. <laughs> I particularly like looking out of a round window. <laughs> Back in my youth when I was studying design, it was presented by many architects all around the world that building your own habitat is a human right. That conversation and that impetus has been lost to us through the legislative process. And I actually see that tiny houses allow us to come back to that. I think there you've touched on one of the absolute most core things that made me fall in love with tiny houses. I do mm -hmm. see this as being an ability for us to reclaim an innate human right to construct our own home. We actually named the house Le Petit de Habitaire, which was after, who was that? No, that's uh, uh, Cabossier. That, yeah, it's the architect Le Cabossier, who actually designed a metal house in the 50s. And he was wanting to liberate people. He thought that if you give people a productionized house and the things they need, then they're freed up to live a inquiring life. And he, but he, he didn't take into account the consumerism goes on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> people don't know what enough is. <laughs> I really love the look of the outside of the home. It is so artistic what you've done here and I cannot wait to see what you've done inside. Can we right. check it out? Yes, yeah, sure. Yes. Through All the right. gateway. <laughs> Through the gate. Cool. This is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> These pop-outs have just created a tremendous feeling of space in here, haven't they? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's actually doubled the amount of space, but also the aesthetic of space. So how large is this home? 32 square meters, we think. And for us, a really big thing was not to have a loft. So for several reasons, partly because we're both a little older, but yeah. the thought of, you know, the climbing up and down and we just said, okay, we're not going to do a loft. So that was our first design challenge. And so we had lots of ideas of, you know, split floors and beds that pulled out or coming from the wall. And then we just decided to pop out the back. And so that was in marrying that with this idea of actually making this front area a room rather than just a deck on the front then meant that we've gone long as long this way as we have that way. So that's about yeah. seven meters and this is about seven meters long. Having reached a level of conclusion now, we actually think, oh, we got it right. <laughs> 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 well, I certainly agree. You did get this space right because just walking in here, it feels absolutely wonderful to mm. me. Can you talk to me about how you've laid out the space in here? One of the main determinants was that we wanted a solar north aspect. Mm. And we had an idea that we'd eventually have a little greenhouse in the front if we lived in a cold climate. So I, I always see that the northeast corner of the house is potentially the it's nicest for the kitchen because you wake up and you have your breakfast where there's light and warmth first thing in the morning, particularly if you're in a cold climate. And the west is like for finishing up for cleaning. So that's where we have the shower and a back door to the compost toilet. So the south aspect is a retiring. So the bed ends up there. I wanted a curved roof, particularly so you could live within it and 
it does give you a feeling of being nested within a space. Now this northern part of the home is mm. absolutely beautiful and it looks like this is a space which is set up to be very multifunctional. Yeah. The other thing for us personally is we are floor dwellers. <laughs> so we've both lived for uh, quite some time in India. So the idea of not having to fit in your know, chairs, tables, lounges, again, made it really easy for us. Also, one of my um, you know, lifestyle things really is I've been a yoga teacher and a yoga practitioner for 35 years. So I needed a space that I could do yoga in. So I can do yoga here or I can do yoga here. I have, now but, I have some space. You always call this your yoga room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, that was really important too, to have that space that was protected and in the house. And then I see for when it does get colder, you're also <laughs> armed with a pretty good sized stove <laughs> in here. We've had it going and I've tested the oven. It does beautiful baked potatoes, but you do have a real problem. I have to open three windows. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's wait, not wait. that bad, he's exaggerating. But there is a water jacket in there and there will be an accompanying uh, hot water system just outside. And that'll be next to the shower over there that's still waiting mm. to happen yeah now all throughout the house i see these wonderful art pieces <laughs> and statues and everything can you talk to me about where all this came from is this just a lifetime of collecting stuff on your travels <laughs> or how did this all come about it's definitely a lifetime you know we have culled back to what we feel are the essentials and so yeah just keeping and picking up the things that we really love and then finding somewhere to put them and it was a bit of an organic process this wall behind you that I was kind of like well where am I going to put you know my musical instruments and my sort of imagery that I like to have and my frame drums and suddenly it was like oh there's a wall that that's going to work for so and it's from all sorts of places from Greece gifts from people just unpacking and and we've really just held on to the most exquisite things really so it's lovely to now start to get them out and have them around us again in the house i think both of us are very aware there's a recent term i've come across it's called object entanglement i think we're pretty close to not being a victim to that <laughs> so the objects we have they're like my tools and i can see even Gory's tool. So they're there to keep inspiring us. Yeah, so it's part of a work in progress in a way. There's constant evolution of ideas and, and processes. Yeah. I love that idea. I've never heard of that term before, but it makes perfect sense. And I <laughs> love that sentiment about the objects that we have in our life serving that purpose. And even if they're not functional as tools, being able to even potentially on a more spiritual level inspire us to be a certain way in the world. Mm. Yeah. I love that mm. idea. And now, moving into the next part of the home, here we have your lovely kitchen. Yeah, I am a caterer and a passionate cook, so I was like, right, I have to have a workable kitchen. We were actually living in a house, full house, but it had this really small kitchen, and we started measuring that up. We were like, this is only a metre long, like that will fit in a tiny house. So, like I said, I, I really wanted to have a full kitchen. And I think another really big breakthrough, which was Nirvana's idea, was about a fridge. We didn't want to take space with an upright fridge. We wanted to look at solutions for having a fridge that can also double as a surface space. So mm. that was your idea. The beauty of it is that you've got an instant top surface. And that surface there was an old table we had. And the legs to that table are holding up the benches there. Over there. So. <laughs> So not only the objects have to have multifunction, but the material needs to <laughs> has come to multifunctions too. We've got very good at cannibalizing, you know, anything that we've got around, you know, old tables or all sorts of things. We're like, oh, we can cut that up and put that here or there. So this that you're leaning on. That's probably the oldest piece I've got. That's my first drawing board at art <laughs> school. <laughs> really? <laughs> but it's slightly smaller now, but I can still put out a drawing. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love how you've included that. And these may have all been items that were cannibalized from elsewhere, mm. but they all fit perfectly together in here, don't they? Yeah. 
One of the other things that I noticed in here that's very clever is that it looks like you've used some underfloor storage there. Yeah, so this was our boat building inspiration. So we have storage all the way along here. Yeah. And what I have out is sort of everyday use. All my pots hanging right up high. I have my big pots if I'm doing a catering job and things that I need bigger yeah. things for. And under the floor is kind of, I know they're there and I go there quite often. So that's what I've got in here. I've got spare jars, our first aid kit, a few spare pots and things and our potatoes and onions, for example. Then all this is just fairly much one long storage area. So this is the office. <laughs> our printer, some sewing things, some games, the iron, which we don't use that much. And there's two more spaces. This runs down a long space and it's really just got the sorts of things in it like old files and things that you need to keep. I have to say though, for about a year, all our books were under the floor while we were building and it just felt like a liberation to get them out. It was awful having them under the floor. So it's nice to have space available for what it was really meant for now. I'm sure it was. <laughs> and it is fantastic to see that your books now have a very dedicated wall all to themselves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have them on steel pegs and they're loose planks and there's framing under there, but these come out. So when we eventually move the house, these side doors are hinged and they come in, so th these are entire doors. <laughs> I am very curious about how you've done all this because this is a tiny house which is designed to be on the road traveling and meets the legal mm. dimensions when it travels. So how, from an engineering perspective, have you accomplished its ability to expand like this? I knew it would need to be towed by a five ton flatbed truck. So that means all the panels, the modular panels that I've introduced in this design, will be stored on a flatbedded truck. So the, that back wall is one unit, the roof is another unit, and these exterior walls on the front are one unit. In the front, the floor is on a steel frame that is hinged, and it's pulled up with this winching device here because it's far too heavy for even three people to lift. And, and there's a strap that goes all the way through to this roller and down to the front edge. So the floor comes up and locks into place with bolts and then the roof comes down and the roof is actually on air struts on the outside. And this was the gorgeous work of the trailer constructors. And they would come up with these ideas. So it was gorgeous working with them because they were just as creative as I was. And I often just had to say, yeah, that's a fantastic idea. We've got to go with that here. <laughs> that is very clever. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and now, your bedroom. What a comfortable and welcoming looking space this is. Yeah, well, this is our newest addition. So when we were designing the bedroom space, we did have a limitation, I guess, of how deep we could go with these bedroom walls, being that that was going to fold into this opening because we needed to leave enough space obviously for a kitchen and for what we're calling our dressing room down here, dressing room, bathroom area. The idea is that the end of the bed here is a makeshift lounge, <laughs> just like that. So this is sort of like a little sitting area. And then at night when we go to bed, obviously we just jump in. Absolutely fantastic. And then let's talk about what is going on down the end here. So we've got your dressing area and you mentioned before that you were converting this space into a shower. How does that work? So the idea with the shower was to try to multi-purpose the space and we wanted to have a door out here because eventually we'll have our composting toilet out the back here on the little landing. We thought, oh, we want to have a door. We've got to have a shower. Let's put them together. Why not make a stealth shower? So the, the idea here is underneath the floor here, these are loose boards and there's a sump under there. So the shower water will go under there. All the piping will be in here. We'll use the firebox, which is just there to heat the water and the shower itself will come out of the wall here. This wall will eventually be a copper lined wall. So it'll look really beautiful. And the wall here for the cupboard will build in that shower space and, and make use of that. So that was the thinking. And then we can have that kind of indoor outdoor thing with opening the door. So we put this split door 
You can just have that open, steam will go straight out. We've got this nice pop out of the round window as well. And if it's a really beautiful day, you can have the whole thing open and out to the nature, just showering. I love the indoor outdoor shower thing. I feel like this is a really beautiful compromise. And right now on this property, mm. you do have an outdoor toilet and you also have set up an outdoor shower for yes. the time being, haven't you? Yes, we have. Our outdoor shower is on a solar system and works beautifully for us. So that's sort of the winter project to really get this shower up and running, hot water running off the system out there. But for now, we have a very beautiful outdoor shower standing in the garden. And so how long have you actually been living in the home now? Ah, uh, well, in various stages of completedness, about a year. And so far, is tiny house life living up to your expectations? It actually has gone beyond our expectations because we're able to concentrate the aesthetics and to use really beautiful quality material and just spend time contemplating Oh, what, what do we want to do with this? We've actually changed some of the finishes and colors two or three times already. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so. Yes, I think what gives us the greatest pleasure is the aesthetic we've created. And if, when we go away and we come back, I know we both feel it. We just feel such a sense of oh, we're in our own space and isn't it beautiful? And we love it. We love coming in the door and it just always feels so warm and beautiful and homey for us here. Yeah. Can I ask you about the cost involved in building this home? Okay, so we set a budget of $40,000 and I think we we sort of stopped counting at about 38,000 and the 40,000 feels like it ran out quite some time ago. We think we're probably at about $50,000. Given that the trailer was $15,000 yeah. for the trailer and the superstructure, which we know was a very good deal. We think we've done really, really well. We still have big infrastructures probably like getting the plumbing and when we go to solar we've got half of that system but we need to spend a few more grand on that yeah i the think thing, we'll get by with about sixty thousand for the yeah. whole thing it has been a nice process i think for us in part of our life story that we partnered only recently you know as as an older couple we both had these big families so it was building the house was part of the journey of sort of getting rid of all the old stuff that we accumulated and had with us when we had these big families and actually giving that stuff to our children and just saying well we actually don't need that now and so for me that's a really important part of getting older is taking those conscious steps of yeah, just having what's important in life and having what's meaningful and keeping what's beautiful and just letting the rest go. Mm. Relationships are cultivated. So this is a way of cultivating our relationship. Because we weren't going to have any more babies. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so this is our baby. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this home is absolutely fantastic. I think from an engineering perspective, what you have accomplished here is very clever. Perhaps even more importantly, artistically, it is such a beautiful and welcoming space. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing Thank it you. with me. Oh, Thank you. Thanks, Bryce. Thank <laughs> you for coming. What I really love about this home is just how thoroughly each and every aspect of it has been thought out. You can really tell that there is some engineering genius that goes into making all this possible. And these pop-outs go a long way to making this house a really great option for living in long term. More than that though, it is the art and the beauty that fill each and every corner of this house that truly makes it a home.